Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Hugo with uh, Kyle Peterson and Alicia Finley. Okay, let's zero in a little bit on Scott Besant, who was uh, Trump's choice late Friday for the Treasury Secretary. Besant is a hedge fund investor, uh, got extensive experience under George Soros at that investment shop, but that doesn't mean his politics are left wing at all. It means that was a make money shop, (laughs) and uh, he did do that. Now he runs his own hedge fund. Uh, He certainly knows financial markets, which is significant. He uh, came in to see us and I thought put on a pretty good show of uh, economic knowledge, even if we don't agree about everything. And the markets are happy. I mean, the uh, bond yields fell on Monday, Alicia, and stocks are up. It's something of a relief rally. We People didn't know who they were going to get for Treasury. Some folks thought it would be Robert Lighthizer, the tariff impresario. But Besson is reassuring for Treasury in that sense to markets. But I would argue that he better enjoy the honeymoon now because uh, he's going to have a big challenge ahead trying to make economic policy sensible and pro-growth amid the many contradictions of Donald Trump's views. Right. And part of the challenge that he will have will be over the extension of the 2017 tax cuts and tax reforms. And Trump had, during the campaign, effectively called for repealing some of it or at least eroding it with all kinds of new carve-outs for Social Security, tips, and such, which is basically goes against what the whole purpose of the tax reform was, was, which was to simplify the code and to become more efficient, which encouraged more investment. Now, Trump is talking about also making some carve-outs for manufacturing to invest in the U.S. and kind of using this as a way to uh, encourage more onshoring. He also wants to impose an across-the-board 10 to 20 percent tariff, which he says will raise enough revenue to pay for all of his other tax cuts, which I'm very skeptical of. But essentially, he wants to uh, use industrial policy, including tariffs, in ways that would really distort markets and create inefficiencies and could depress investments, which I think is really the opposite of what Scott Best said. He kind of realizes that you need more growth if we want to attempt to grow our way out of these deficits and debt. One of the uh, challenges for Besant, in contrast to the first term as well, he may be a lonely pro-growth voice inside the administration. And I say that we don't know because we don't know yet who will be head running the National Economic Council in the White House, which coordinates economic policy across the government in the first term. That was Gary Cohen for the first year, then Larry Kudlow for the last three, both pro-growth voices. And the NEC advisor talks to Trump, you know, can talk to him three times a day when the uh, economic policy debates are hot. There's also nobody named yet for the Council of Economic Advisors. That was Kevin Hassett in the first term. And Hassett was, again, a pro-growth market-oriented voice. This time, we don't know who those will be. And they may be some folks who, uh, there have been some rumors that Peter Navarro, the economist, the gadfly economist who hung around Trump in the White House in the first term, could have the NEC job. That's not confirmed, but that has been suggested that Trump has, I know for a fact that Trump has considered that idea. And then there's the role of Stephen Miller, who is the deputy chief of staff, known for his policy on immigration, but he's going to have a bigger brief this time. And I think he'll play a bigger role in economic policy. And Besson will have to confront all of those countervailing forces inside the administration, Kyle. And that's part of why observers use the term jump ball when they talk about what the policy outcomes in a second Trump administration might look like. And that's some of what happened in the first Trump administration. You'd hear the reporting coming out of the White House that it was a back and forth. And the position that the president took, the position that Donald Trump took, seemed to depend on whom he had spoken to last, who was last in his ear. I would second what Alicia said about Besant. He seems like he 
has instincts in the right direction. The Journal has a new story saying that he has pitched Trump on a policy he calls 333, which is getting the budget deficit down to 3% of GDP, getting growth, GDP growth, the growth in the economy to 3% a year, and then producing an additional 3 million barrels of oil per day. And that seems like a pretty strong economic formula, something that might be marketable out in the general public. And by the way, that is a pretty traditional conservative Republican economic thinking. This is the kind of stuff that you can imagine the first Trump term being advised to do by Speaker Paul Ryan or even Republican candidates for office before that. But the challenge will be Besant has a department to run and there will be other voices in his ear talking about things like tariffs, which are only going to subtract from that GDP growth scenario. Well, the things you talked about, uh, 333, those are goals. Okay. 3% GDP growth. Great. I like that. You know, getting the deficit down to 3% of GDP, that will take some real cutting, which he's going to need the cooperation of Congress to do and certainly was belied by Trump's first term. Wasn't as spendthrift as Biden, but he was pretty spendthrift, <laughs> Alicia. And then the, the, you know, the, the barrel, 3 million more barrels a day, you know, if Bergam and uh, Wright get the policies correct, that could happen, assuming we have global demand stay high. I would put a premium, though, on natural gas and liquefied natural gas projects as much as on oil. So the question is, can Besant make the tax bill pro-growth? Can he get Trump to minimize the tariffs enough? There are going to be tariffs. Okay, Trump is hell-bent on tariffs. There will be tariffs, but will they be mild enough or limited enough that they won't do too much damage to growth? I think those are key questions for Besson. I think that's right. And if you look back on Trump's first administration, the 2018 was boom year for growth and investment. This came on the heels of the tax reform. Um, companies were repatriating their earnings from overseas and investing in new equipment and factories and such. And then 2019, you actually saw a fall off on growth. And especially toward the end, the economy almost looked like it wasn't just slowing down, but could have entered recession in 2020, it even had it not been for the pandemic. And part of that was because of his tariffs it had created all kinds of uncertainty. And when we talk about supply chains, it definitely jumbled supply chains because all of a sudden companies were having to source materials from other places and get around the tariffs and manufacturers, for example, secondary steel manufacturers or the, that use the raw steel produced elsewhere, they were having to cut jobs because they were getting slammed with the steel tariffs. And so you actually saw a decline in manufacturing jobs at the end of the 2019 as well. And so I think that it really depends on how sweeping the tariffs are going to be. If it's very targeted toward abuses, as Besset has said, and use it as a negotiating tool to get China to actually change some of its mercantile policies, the tariffs weren't terribly effective during the Trump administration at doing that. But again, it's going to depend on how sweeping these tariffs are. All right. Uh, Of course, the ultimate question in terms of who gets these jobs will be, can they be confirmed by the Senate? I think the Republicans in the Senate have given every indication that they will want to use their own advice and consent power and get a vote on these nominees. Even if Trump has said, no, I just want them to allow us to make recess appointments. As far as confirmation, I'd say that uh, nearly all of them will be confirmed without too much difficulty, I would say. Tulsi Gabbard at DNI, Pete Hegseth at Defense, and RFK Jr. at HHS are the three to have the most trouble, although RFK Jr. could get the help of some Democrats because he's for price controls on drugs and some other Democratic policies. Interesting question will be whether Republicans in the Senate decide that Chavez de Raymer at labor is just way too far. And we'll have to see how those nominations go. All right. I want to thank Kyle. I want to thank Alicia. Thank you all for listening. We're here every day for Potomac Watch, and it's going to be an interesting ride, this Trump too. Thanks for listening.